evening. Welcome to APTN News Weekend. I'm Melissa Ridgen. We're glad you could join us. Well, over a dozen lawyers from across the country have filed a request pro bono to the International Criminal Court requesting that those involved in the Kamloops Indian Residential School be investigated. APTN's Tamara Pimentel spoke with some of the lawyers in Alberta. It is a subject that is near to my heart. My mom having attended one of these schools, the fallout from her attendance of that school, the, the impact it had on her and, and on the rest of the family. Andrew Fipers is one of 15 lawyers calling on the International Criminal Court to investigate Canada and the Vatican for crimes against humanity following the discovery of 215 graves at the Kamloops Indian Residential School. He's based out of Red Deer, Alberta, but as a member of the Tanaha First Nation in BC, Pfeiffer says some members of his community also attended this institution. To me, uh, initiating this, this process with the International Criminal Court and characterizing it as a crime against humanity is, is fundamentally important in order to get uh, answers. And he says an international court is the only way to get those answers. The fact is is that the government of Canada, including the RCMP and including the Vatican, including the churches, all have a vested interest in the truth not coming out. Calgary-based lawyer Brendan Miller said the investigation could lead to the prosecution of the Catholic Church, the government of Canada, and any living member that took part in the residential school. I have to remember that continuing to suppress and cover up a crime against humanity is a crime against humanity itself. And it is a prosecutorially uh, a prosecutable offence, both domestically under Canada's Crimes Against Humanity and War Crimes Act and at international law under the Rome Statute. Right now, the longer that this information and documents and evidence continues to be suppressed and covered up by the government, they are committing a crime against humanity. On June 7th, the International Criminal Court System wrote a response stating it has opened a file to determine whether or not the investigation will go through. It's frankly an absolute embarrassment uh, to this country that Canada, who is one of the founding members of the UN, one of the founding members of the Rome Statute creating the International Criminal Court, one of the purported great human rights advocates and supporters of the United Nations internationally, has failed miserably in dealing with this massive crime against humanity. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. Many hoping for an apology from the Vatican were disappointed last weekend when the Pope only said that he was, quote, pained by the discovery of the 215 children buried in Kamloops, BC. But the Archbishop of Vancouver is going further than that. And he sat down for a one-on-one -on -one with reporter Tina House. Archbishop Michael, thank you very much for sitting down with us today. You're very welcome. And it's a pleasure for me to be able to do so, Tina. Now with the discovery of these 215 children that were found buried in, in Kamloops, what would you like to say about that? I think what I'd like to certainly once again express my sorrow, apology, um, commitment to do something about it. But it was, of course, a very sad revelation for all of us. The TRC had indicated that there was something like this, but there was so much information at the TRC that it probably didn't get the particular attention it deserved. It strikes a chord, I think, and that's evident across the country, how it's resonated with people. Uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's tragic, um, and it raises the whole question once again, as probably should be raised, uh, once again, of the whole Indian residential school system that was, I think, um, a dark period of Canadian history that we have to own. We, can't forget it and this was I think a pretty stark reminder of of that reality. The Pope just spoke this past Sunday and said that he was very pained by the trauma Sorry. that indigenous people are yes. now going through because of the discovery but stopped short at actually issuing a real apology. Would you like to take this opportunity to send an apology to the survivors? I would certainly love to send a, a, an apology to, to survivors, to their families, and even, you know, perhaps even down through the generations, families that have been affected by this, even if, 
even if it was the case of a child lost many years ago. Um, we don't forget those things. Those things remain engraved in a, in a family's history. And um, these are things that should not have happened. And um, certainly I offer apology, um, a sincere apology. Everybody is asking the Pope for this apology. Why do you think he's hesitant? You know, looking at it a few days later, later it, it might have been a missed opportunity. Um, but, you know, the actual reasons why he didn't use the word apologize, he used sorrow and pain. Uh, Tina, I, I really don't know that, you know. This past week, we've been covering nonstop stories from survivors, yeah. from leadership, from people that are deeply affected by the horrific abuses done to these innocent children. Yes. How can we move on from this? How, how can the church make, make it right? You know, to admit a kind of, not a kind of, to admit guilt where, it, where, where, where it's due for the things that were done wrong that are indefensible. That's just some of that interview. You can watch the rest with Archbishop Miller on our website, aptnnews.ca. Well, to Nova Scotia now, where the search began for graves at a former residential school and Mi'kmaq community gathered to pray for the 215 children found in Kamloops. Angel Moore was there. About 30 people came to the powwow grounds at Sabaganagati First Nation to honor the children of Kamloops Residential School. Elder Earl Sack is a firekeeper and a sun dancer. As an elder, I like to say that we're praying for them. We smoke our pipes for them. We do our ceremonies for them. No matter how far away they are, they're standing next to us. And that's, that's what we think and that's what we do. Yeah. The only residential school in Mi'kma'ki opened from 1930 to 1967. The National Center for Truth and Reconciliation has identified 16 children who died at the school, but people fear there are more. Sack says finding the truth will start the healing. Finally, it finally come out in the open and it's really good. It's really good. It has to be uh, known out there around the world at what happened. You know. A sacred fire, a pipe ceremony, prayers, and a feast. It's all ceremony that Elder Shirley Ann Nevin Taylor says was not allowed by the church. Because as a child, we were not allowed <clears throat> to participate, or we didn't have anything like this when I was a child. And uh, uh, it was because of the church and what their beliefs were. Our, our spirituality didn't count at all. As ceremony continued, an investigative team started the search for graves at the site of the former Shubenacadie Residential School. It was requested by Sabaganagadi First Nation and led by Jonathan Fowler, anthropologist and associate professor at St. Mary's University. So we're going to map all of it and we're going to use multiple instruments and we're going to bring that data to the community so that community members can then tell us where to look uh, with the radar and other tools. Fowler said the search will take a few weeks. The results will be presented to community members who will decide how to proceed forward. Angel Moore, APTN, Sabaganagadi, First Nation. The Sioux Valley Dakota Nation in Manitoba is working to identify students buried at the Brandon Indian Residential School and they're partnering with researchers from across the country to conduct that investigation. Daryl Stranger explains. No one really knows how many children are buried at the Brandon Residential School, which operated from 1895 to 1972. Through research and interviews, the team of university researchers, along with the Sioux Valley Dakota Nation, hope to identify the children and work with their families and communities. The families and communities whose children were lost while attending these schools have questions that deserve answers. The children buried at these sites must have their identities restored and their stories told. They will never be forgotten. Every child matters. Chief Bone said they have identified a number of potential graves so far. While employing archaeological survey techniques, geophysical technologies, survivor accounts and archival documents, our investigation has identified 104 potential graves in all three cemeteries and that only 78 are accountable through cemetery and burial records. 
Investigations into the cemeteries and unmarked graves at the school began in 2012. The project received funding seven years later, but that work was interrupted by the pandemic. Project lead Eldon Yellowhorn is an archaeologist and professor of Indigenous Studies at Simon Fraser University. He hopes this work will bring closure to the families. In instances where you know, they might be one or two generations removed from these individuals, uh, you know, like if, if that person had grown up and become somebody's uncle, you know, that, that they'll never know that. So this is one way for them to uh, bring some closure for their families and their communities. Forensic methods like radar and drone survey are being deployed. Yellowhorn believes this project can be an example for other communities who want to undertake similar projects. It's very important for our communities to have some control over uh, our our lives and our histories. Ultimately, you know, like what I would like to show is that we, we're the ones who are capable of doing this, you know. Uh, we don't have to wait for experts to come from any other community. We can be the experts, you know. There is no timeline for when the work might be completed, mostly due to the pandemic. Daryl Stranger, APT National News, Winnipeg. With the massive amount of news coverage of the discovery of the Kamloops graves, many of the residential school survivors are being triggered by this new information. Here's Priscilla Wolf with the supports that are helping them. <laughs> to cry. Rex Lumberjack is a survivor and he used to be an Indian residential school counselor. He says the work got to be too much and this recent news coverage has also triggered him. People say, ah, get over it. People who say that to us, get over it. But how do you get over grief and loss? I lost my childhood, my innocence, my, my youth here. I'm even part of my adulthood trying to drink myself to death. And, you, and I did mention three weeks ago I tried to, I attempted suicide. This was before the story broke, right? Now with the news coverage of the graves being uncovered in BC and at the school he attended, Muscaugan Indian Residential School, he feels a bit vindicated. I'm not called a liar as much. <laughs> It didn't happen. That could not happen, right? And that, even that is, I went through the IAP process, right? And then the, the day school process right here was, this is a recognized day school. At Lumberjack home. adds, memories are being brought back up and people have to deal with them, with self-care, reflection, and talking to other people like peer counselors. He also finds comfort in residential school gatherings with his peers. It's comforting knowing that I'm amongst survivors, that they truly understand what we endured here in the late 60s, early 70s. George Morasti is one of those peer counselors. He is also a survivor and he works as a resolution health support worker in Prince Albert. He attended the Prince Albert Residential School in the 1960s. He says the news coverage has been hard on him. Uh, yes, it's been really, uh, it's been hard, you know, because uh, uh, I, I got triggered a few times. Things that I have forgotten uh, came to light and uh, I had to have a good support system. He says survivors helping survivors is one of the best ways to help. One of the things that I find most helpful, I guess, uh, would be a survivor to, to help another survivor uh, of how they came through, uh, what they did, you know, to, to begin their healing journey. Lumberjack and Morasti are on a lifelong healing journey as survivors, and even though Lumberjack can no longer counsel his peers, they both find comfort in Canada, knowing the truth with proof. Uh, at least uh, the evidence is there now that you can't deny, you know, what happened, you know, like, because uh, there's so much denial, you know, we, to them it didn't happen. You know, and now at least it's out in the open. Priscilla Wolf, ABT National News, Saskatoon.
Interesting to note the residential school survivor crisis line has seen a 265% increase in calls in the wake of the Kamloops Graves discovery. Well, we need to take a break, but there's more news ahead, including a touching look at the personal life of Joyce Ashaquan before she died in a Quebec hospital. Stay with us. Welcome back. A sentence in the death of Anishinaabekwe Barbara Kentner was handed down last week in Thunder Bay. Braden Bushby received an eight-year prison term. Kentner died of injuries sustained after Bushby threw a trailer hitch out of a moving vehicle, hitting her in the stomach. Bushby was found guilty in December and had been awaiting sentencing. Justice Helen Peace said Bushby's actions had both immediate and far-reaching impacts. Bushby applied for both bail and house arrest within hours of the decision, but was denied. He's also looking to appeal his conviction. Calls to his defense attorneys were not returned. Well, the world was introduced to Joyce Eshaquan in the late, uh, late September 2020 after she live streamed her dying moments on Facebook. But dozens of other videos published on social media provide an intimate look at her life. So with exclusive permission from the Eshaquan family, Lindsay Richardson brings us Joyce in a completely new way. If a picture's worth a thousand words, what about video? Joyce Eshaquan filmed everything. The important things. Memories to be cherished forever. Others, not so much. An 18th birthday. Her family. Her children. And her husband, Carol, <laughs> who always made her laugh. <laughs> the Eshaquan family's lawyer granted APTN exclusive access to these videos to remind the public of Joyce's life before her live video taken last September 28th, before everything changed. <laughs> <laughs> aux conjoints, aux parents, aux enfants, amis de Joyce et à la communauté, merci pour votre courage, merci pour votre résilience, votre force. The coroner's inquest examining Joyce's death officially ended just over a week ago. Experts went on record saying it was preventable, that Joyce was a casualty of the flawed environment at Joliet Hospital. The video in which she live-streamed her last moments drew international outrage. But in court testimony, she was labeled narcotic-dependent, an aggressive woman in poor health who struggled with mental illness. This is not the woman her family knew. Even Joyce's young son, too shy to speak in this 2018 video, couldn't stay quiet after losing his mom. À vos enfants, Monsieur Dubé, il faudra leur raconter que la petite révolution de la réconciliation a débuté grâce à leur maman. Except standing up takes its toll. Joyce's eldest daughter received death threats after testifying. And while bodyguards were hired to protect hospital workers during the inquest, the Eshaquan family received no support. <laughs> this is why thousands of people came from all over Quebec to march at the end of the inquest. The fear is still very real. Quand je regarde ce qui est ce qui est arrivé, ça me fait vraiment mal. J'ai j'ai peur pour ces enfants, nos enfants. J'ai peur pour mes petits enfants. J'ai peur pour tout. Tantôt on est rentré dans un restaurant avec ma fille. Là, là. Ils nous regardaient comme si on était des des, des criminels parce qu'on était habillés comme ça. Puis je demande que le gouvernement reconnaisse qu'il existe le racisme systémique partout autant. Autant chez 
chez les hôpitaux, mais dans le système des hôpitaux, puis les centres jeunesse également aussi chez nos jeunes. Quebec insists it's addressing the issue in stages, but they're not bowing to pressure from the United Nations to adopt Joyce's principle, the health plan named for the mother of seven. L'Assemblée nationale adhère au principe de Joyce. Greg Kelly, a Liberal Party MNA, pushed for the principle several times, always with the same result. Y a-t-il consentement pour débattre de cette motion? Pas de consentement, M. le Président. Pas de consentement. But I'm just still a little bit, you know, uh, bewildered by how hard-headed the government is on this. The government always says, well, we want to do things in collaboration with you, and we want to work with you. So then after the Antiquity Nation does their own consultation, they come up with recommendations on how Quebec can fix their health care system. The government says, well, thank you. You know, we acknowledge the, you know, tabling of this report, but we're going to do it our own way anyway. So... Uh, again, I think it's just old attitudes uh, coming to the surface that the government knows best and, and they'll fix the problems. But again, thank you very much for your con contribution to the discussion. There is no date set for the release of the Quebec coroner's report. And while politicians may be stalling, there's movement elsewhere. Donations to the family's fundraiser are spiking. A Justice for Joyce petition has hundreds of new signatures. The media cyclone is winding down. But Caro Dubé says he's still not ready to talk about Joyce, although she's always on his mind. He's been writing about her, and we have the family's permission to share this, too. You were the first to tell me I was handsome, my best partner. We did everything together. You are who you were, smiling, beautiful. Will there be a day or a night, a moment to see you? Why is it in my dreams I can? Why not everywhere? I'll be forever yours, Joyce. You're already waiting for me. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. It's time for another break, but still ahead, an incredible look at the eclipse from earlier this week. You won't want to miss that. Welcome back. Maybe you didn't want to get up at the crack of dawn this week to watch the eclipse, or you did and were disappointed to find that there was cloud cover in the way. Well, luckily, we've got it here. Freelance videographer Steve Mangeau captured the solar eclipse Thursday over the Toronto skyline. He walked a kilometer and a half with all of his camera gear to the escarpment in the Mount Nemo conservation area. He sped up this footage eight times in order to capture the event. The so-called Ring of Fire eclipse was visible from many regions all around the world, but looks like Steve had the best seat in southern Ontario. Well, we are all out of time for your weekend news. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a safe rest of the weekend. I'm Melissa Ridgen.